Welcome everyone. Today we're doing a deep dive into golfer's elbow. It's that annoying pain on the inside of your elbow, otherwise known as medial epicondylitis. It's a terrible, terrible injury. It can be terrible because it's quite difficult to get rid of if you don't have the right strategy. I've got my good friend Phil White from Phil White Physio joining me to take a deep dive into First of all, today, how to diagnose the golfer's elbow, what is golfer's elbow, and really to explain the difference between golfer's elbow and other acute muscle or tendon tears. Strap yourself in. This one is an extremely important topic if you are a gym junkie, crossfitter, or someone who throws, I think, maybe. I don't know. We'll go into all the different things that golfer's elbow will affect shortly. Welcome to our podcast, proudly brought to you by VPA Australia, our trusted supplement provider since Unity Gym started. As sponsored athletes, we're excited to offer you a special 10% discount on top quality supplements that ship worldwide. Just use our discount code from the description. To avoid international shipping fees, contact VPA and tell them we sent you to get a flat shipping rate. Today's episode is also sponsored by the Flexibility Blueprint. Ever felt lost in the sea of social media fitness advice? The Flexibility Blueprint is your map to progress, designed to help you get laser focused on what matters most for your journey in flexibility and strength. And guess what? It's free. Grab it using the link in the description. If you're starting your flexibility journey, don't miss our 20 minute mobility routine. It's your first step to quick wins in flexibility. For those further along, use our Flexibility Masterclass, featuring advanced techniques like loaded stretching and end range strength for the pancake, front splits, middle splits, and more. Links for both are also in the description. And for the seasoned athletes, avoid the frustration of complex training puzzles with our UMS Tribe membership. It's a different online coaching experience with strength and flexibility combined. Don't forget, we're Amazon affiliates too. You can find all the equipment used in our videos and podcasts at the most competitive prices with our affiliate links in the description. Now let's dive into today's episode. Welcome, Phil. How are you today? Very well. Nice to go back to the old golfer's elbow. I felt like we've, it's been a while between drinks, you know, we used to, we always be be talking elbows and yeah, it's good to be back to it because it's, um, yeah, such an an important one and something that definitely most people who, who spend some time in the gym will, will have experienced over the years. Absolutely. And as usual, this show comes off the back of comments on our channel. And then my brother Rad produces content. He's done a really, really great golfer's elbow video here. And then he has, off the back of the success of that, created a a new blueprint for golfer's elbow. And this is a huge document. It's very extensive. You can get access to this. I'll leave a link in the description of both the podcast and if you're watching on YouTube, YouTube. Uh, This takes you through a lot of content because both myself, Rad, and believe it or not, Phil has, we've all had it. And Phil's story is actually quite unique. My my history with golfer's elbow goes right back to 2006. I got it the first time there just doing regular sort of bodybuilding and boxing. I was boxing at the same time. So I had this unique sort of scenario where I was training seven days a week for boxing, but Sunday was kind of a a back off day where we just did a bit of cardio and recovery work, usually a swim or something. Uh, But every other day I was, you know, there was this pretty intense movement going on in my elbows, not related to gripping, but it was putting stress and load on my elbow. Then going into the gym, I was doing bodybuilding style workouts and not really being 100% honest with my boxing coach about what I was doing in the gym. And I was training for, for muscle gain. You know, I wanted to look good because I was quite vain and, and young. And you know what we do, we, we do silly things when we're young, tend to overload the body, ended up with really bad golfers elbow. Now, I went to a physio at that stage in the gym there and I was told to rest and take some time off. And, you know, it's really interesting because then many years later, eventually I got over it, but it took about two years and it was pretty bad. It was ruthless. The pain stuck around for a long time. I had the wrong approach. Then fast forward about a decade and in Unity Gym, I had an experience with Phil and I got golfer's elbow and I was told to do something very, very different. And we're going to talk about that strategy later on. But the two pieces of advice were vastly different. One from like, take, you know, three weeks off and then come back and see how it goes. And the surprising thing is, and we get this all the time, it, you come back after three weeks off and it feels worse. It's, it's like it's gotten worse despite the fact that you've rested. And I, I'm going to ask Phil why that is and get him to talk about that in a moment. But you know, what I want to really talk about and drill into and get the answers for from an expert, a physiotherapist 
who's not only rehabbed and, and supported a lot of patients through golfer's elbow or tennis elbow, whether it's medial or lateral epicondylitis, he's given it to himself to have the experience and figure out better ways of dealing with it, which is wild. And I think that's a great place to start this story. Seemed like a great idea at the time. Really? Like, <laughs> I was like, you know, too easy. I'll just give myself the injury and then rehab it back. And I'd, I'd had pretty much every other injury <laughs> that you can have up until that point, just playing a lot of sport and generally like not understanding strength conditioning and, and injury prevention when I was younger. And so I was like, so I sort of ticked the boxes for pretty much every injury. And I felt like that always gave me a, a lot of, you know, empathy and understanding of my patients. But in, when I was working in your gym, like, especially as I was getting started, I, I was mostly treating people from the gym and because you have such a good balanced program, <laughs> like there just weren't many injuries and like people were getting really good technique coaching. So you weren't getting all of the sort of run in the mill stuff that you'd kind of hope for when you start up in a, in a gym, you know, all these nice people getting injured from yeah, doing we were, crazy we sunglasses. The, like you were just, <laughs> we were the worst was, gym. We were the worst gym. You yeah. should have gone and got a job in a CrossFit gym or something yeah. like that. You yeah, know, exactly. I, but, I, joke, I, joke. Alas, I love, I love you to, to yeah, like with your balance program, everything was pretty good. But a lot of people who hadn't done much strength training before, and particularly getting into calisthenics and more body weight stuff, started to it just be started to be the most common presentation was people with with golfers' elbows. So that's that medial elbow tendinopathy. And so, just to be clear, it's a, on the inside of your elbow. So if you had your arms by your side, it'd be the bit that's basically touching your body if you're in the anatomical position, which is like your palms facing forward, like the Da Vinci. Um, so the image there. So it's right on the inside there. And just so many people were getting pain there. And I thought like I'd done all the, you know, study at uni about it. Most like a lot of the research is around lower limb. So I'd sort of, you know, seen all the, the research about it and I'd, I'd studied it, but I thought, you know, I always do learn the most when I experience myself. <laughs> and there was one common sort of thing that kept on coming up with how people were managing their tendinopathy that made me kind of frustrated which was like looking for you know specific sort of silver bullet exercises or thinking to like you know that certain exercises are bad and certain exercises are good and so what i wanted to test myself was that kind of the idea that it's you know it's not about which exercise you're doing it's just it's about it's about the amount of loading and so i used the same exercises to injure myself which was get, which was supinated grip so like a bicep dominant pull up and then a wrist curl using using dumbbells and i use that that same those same two movements and just did an abusive load. So basically too much more than my body was prepared for. I did that by doing as many pull-ups as I could in a week <laughs> and just constantly whenever I was by a bar, which was nearly all the time, I'd just try and do some pull-ups and then do as many wrist curls to failure as I could. And then kind of wanted to show that it's like, it is that those same exercises that actually do end up rehabbing it. It's just a matter of that appropriate dosing. So that's my little story of giving myself medial elbow so tendinopathy. So and... effectively you did your own scientific research experiment inside Unity Gym to prove your thesis, which was um, right. Yeah, I mean, I probably end. could have controlled more variables, but like, yeah, it was a, <laughs> if I was to be purely scientific about it, probably wasn't, you know, research study worthy, but certainly, yeah, I do find that like practical education of, of like testing what's out there as, as useful. And I wouldn't recommend other people do this, but yeah, it's quite interesting for myself to, to go through it. I, I just want to take a pause because this is this is a moment that I think everyone needs to really, really listen to and pay attention to because there is a vast difference between the type of physical therapist or physiotherapist who would do that <laughs> and the general population's physical therapist or physiotherapist or even a general practitioner like your beautiful partner who, you know, is unlikely to. <laughs> to put themselves <laughs> GP. under yep. to th GP, <laughs> to throw themselves under the bus. So when you go to someone like that, they're not going to have the same experience and they're certainly not going to have the same insight about that sort of yeah. injury, you know, again, like, we... I definitely don't, definitely don't recommend other practitioners do this or, or other people do. But I know over the years of having so many injuries, like you know, it's kind of getting slightly a slight step away from golfer's elbow. But I think it becomes so relevant because you did mention how it is such a, like a terrible, terrible injury. But the the thing that I find so interesting with injury and pain is, you know, there's such a difference between pain and suffering. And I've had so much pain in my life from so many different injuries. And you know, there's certain things now that still niggle me, but there's very few things that actually lead to suffering, which is when that pain or the worry about the injury limits me from doing anything that I want to do. And so while golfer's elbow can be terrible in that it's like hard to get away from the pain, like the actual suffering that causes my life is very limited now, even if it does have a, a, a flare up because I understand it. I know like the risk and reward of, of loading versus, you know, resting. And I know that it's not going to cause me like long-term issues. So I think that's just like, yeah, an interesting one with like having had so many injuries in my life, like, kind of knowing when to not stress too much if I do have a bit of pain. 
And I think that's a really important point to make too, you know, because we get so caught up in that injury identity. We've spoken about that a lot in prior episodes, which is something that you should definitely rewind, go back and watch if you haven't. We covered that in our recent slap tear series on the shoulder rehab content. But yeah, look, I just think it's important to really separate the two different styles of practitioner because if you're a real gym enthusiast or, or an athlete or a sports enthusiast, you know, like you play football or whatever it is, you do combat sports or you do CrossFit or you do even just bodybuilding, you know, I think it's really important that you align yourself with a, a practitioner or a team of practitioners who really understand what you're doing and compassionate to it. Because some people just, some some experts just sort of, go like why are you pushing yourself so hard why are you doing this you just have to remove it you're doing too much and that is always going to either you know be the wrong advice completely or just get you down psychologically because if you love what you do chances are you're not going to change it and and, yeah. and and i think it's important that you, you align yourself with the right team that's i think that's where we want to go so so let's move on let's talk about now so the mechanism that created your goal for zilbo was too many pull-ups and too many bicep curls. Now, we're not vilifying those movements specifically, but they are a yeah, common like was, Yeah, bicep dominant pull-ups, so chin-ups and yep. wrist curls. <clears throat> yep, yep. And, 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 and I really want to make it clear that there's nothing wrong with those movements. What, and what... that's exactly, yeah, the point. And hopefully people that took it away is like, I wanted to show it's exactly those movements that I did to into myself are the same ones I'm using to therapeutically dose and rehab myself. Rehab, exactly. And this is where mm. I want to go. But before before we go to the exercise and how you work yourself out of it, can you explain from your expert knowledge what the difference between golfer's elbow or a, 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 a tendinopathy is in comparison to like an, a, a muscle tear or a, a cartilage tear or a, 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 a tendon tear? Yeah, so really, like, I'm glad we're starting there because it's really important to realize, like, there's, you know, different i mean when thinking just structurally about what's happening um, when you've got pain there like just because you have pain there doesn't mean it is tendinopathy and i think there's lots of like i guess a google diagnosis of people being like my elbow hurts therefore you know see golf elbow and like yep that sounds right and do it when really you got to think about like what other structures are there you've got the tendon itself you've also got the ligaments of your um of your elbow there as well so you got to remember that muscles are like tendons are what attach muscles to bone and then ligaments are what attach bone to bone so you have your collateral ligaments of your elbow under there so if you have like a injury that was more maybe traumatic and you had your elbow bent to one side you know it could be a tendinopathy but it could also be a ligament sprain or, or tear so really important to have that differential diagnosis also oh, when you do have pain Sorry to yeah. interrupt. If anyone watched the UFC on the weekend, my God, there was a Oof. ruthless shoulder elbow dislocation that, oh God, yeah, man, it was horrible. Nasty. Anyway, continue. Sorry. Yeah. So you've also got quite superficial nerves to go through there. So, you know, if anyone's ever hit their funny bone underneath there, like you do have the superficial, the ulnar nerve kind of travels near and around there. So you can have sometimes neural things, you can have referring pain from your shoulder that comes down to your elbow. There's like all these different structures around there that can be contributing. So do make sure that you have been diagnosed and that you know you are actually working with a tendinopathy. But <clears throat> when looking at, I guess, the characteristics of a tendinopathy, and another thing that gets confusing is there's so many different names for it. And already in this episode and in the video that you, know, you showed that Rad shared, like there's already so many different names that have come up. So golfer's elbow, medial epicondylitis, tendinitis, tendinopathy, tendinosis. <laughs> like there's just so many different <laughs> names that have been used for the same thing. And that's where it just becomes a nightmare trying to figure out. <laughs> like, you know, people get so confused. They're like, oh, I don't have a tendinitis. I have a tendinosis or like epicondylitis. So yeah, to be really clear. What did I call it at the start? I think I called it You called it, called it a golf's elbow, then you said epicondylitis. Yep. And yeah, like there's all these names that have been thrown around and that's like, you know, they're not incorrect, but there's trying to be like a bit more of a consensus on terminology and the most accurate that people are talking, like have decided on is, is tendinopathy because anything where you hear itis suggests that it's an inflammatory condition. Anything where you hear osis is a, um, like tendinosis is suggesting a degenerative disease. So like arthritis, arthritis is actually often then called arthrosis. <laughs> it gets confusing, but basically like there used to be a kind of a, it's an inflammatory process. It's a degenerative process, but now there's a realization that there are inflammatory components to the pathology of a tendinopathy. There's also like degenerative processes that go on. And so using tendinopathy is just a more inclusive of like tendinopathy basically means there's, there's a problem with it. <laughs> so there's a problem yeah. with the tendon and that's kind of more inclusive of the fact that it's both inflammatory and degenerative at different stages. And while that might seem a bit like nitpicky and ridiculous, it is important because when people like language matters and when people sort of hear itis and when it's been talked about that medically, then people sort of think, you know, and like if you go see a GP, they're like, oh, don't worry about it, take some meds. 
some not like some anti-inflammatories, ice it, whatever. But then that ends up being completely ineffective for this. And the same way when you hear osis and you think it's like a degenerative thing, then it thinks people think, oh no, I can't load it because it's breaking down. When really, like, it's not that either. <laughs> the so that's why language does sort of matter, and also just gets confusing when you're trying to Google things and you don't know where to <laughs> find the good information. So um, I'm I'm laughing inside because I feel like we just leveled up the wokeness of our podcast by being more inclusive. Mm, indeed. So with the <laughs> golfers joke. and then just the confusion as well as like golfers and tennis elbow, people get confused there. So basically tennis elbow is typically on the outside and golfers is on the inside. And I think like talking about why that's the case is an important thing in understanding the actual, actually what, what's going on in a tendon. Because when it comes to tendinopathy, the tendon is basically dealing with like four different types of load. So you've got tensile load, which is basically like the like rapid so basically like working like a spring so when your tendons like your achilles tendon down in your ankle or your calves are working like a spring that's a tensile load and tendons are so good in our body for being able to produce lots of efficient movement by basically working like springs uh we've also got compressive load so that's when you're actually getting like a squishing of the tendon against a bone so that's a different type of load there's the combination load which is basically like storage compression and tensile load together and then there's going to be your sliding and shearing load which is basically when the peritendon which is the stuff like the connective tissue around the tendon is sliding against other structures which again kind of is more important down in the lower leg but when thinking about those four different types of load the thing that the tendon is most sensitive to is going to be like rapid rate like when you have a high rate of loading so a really fast time when your tendon is dealing with load so think of golf swing if you're doing a a big drive you've got this very fast like moment of kind of impact where you've got the ball connecting with the club then it's producing a like contraction stress and a and a really fast load on the actual tendon itself because you're holding the golf club and let's say stick and really show that i'm not a golfer <laughs> a golf club and <laughs> you're gripping really hard so those forearm muscles that attach into that medial epicondyle which is that bony prominence there when you have that really fast, like sudden moment of that force of the ball, it's enough to basically like you're con having to contract against that ball and it's happening at a really rapid rate of loading. And so that's why it's very common if you're doing, you know, multiple sessions of that, you go into driving range and just whack in the ball when you haven't had, you know, maybe you had some time off or you just really overloaded, then that's why it's called golfer's elbow because it's a really common time for people to get it. Whereas in the tennis elbow, a backhand in tennis is that same idea. So when you're contracting, you're gripping and you're resisting the ball that like really fast rate of loading is why something that seems like it's not a very high load activity in terms of it's not a heavy weight but it's that like really rapid thing that then can be that abusive load which causes the tendinopathy so i think that's just like an important overall concept to understand so that we can look at progressing progressing out of it i actually just remembered that the very first time i got golfer's elbow it was when i started playing golf on the weekend and it was in introducing this new load. And because yeah. I'm so competitive, I was going with a couple, a couple of mates every weekend that, you know, we started to do it as a social thing and I'd never played before. And so I wanted to get, you know, improve quickly. So I started yeah. going to a driving range and really hitting balls to perfect what I was doing. And that combined with my boxing and my gym training was just enough to absolutely overload my body. And that's how I got it the first time. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, so in the couple of minutes that we've got left in this episode, what, what I was under the impression that golfer's elbow or te tendinopathy is like a, a remodeling or changing of the way the tendon is rebuilding or repairing itself. C can you sort of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So when you think about the actual like pathophysiology, so basically like what's happening that causes the injury or like what's happening when you get the injury, if you think about a muscle tear, it's generally like a pretty... And this comes back to, I guess, that like when you're doing that differential diagnosis, not only is it like the area, it's also the, you know, and, and a lot of people wonder how we can diagnose when we haven't got imaging, particularly as an online physio, but really like the behavior of and the, of the symptoms gives us so much information. So when you have an injury that, you know, you've had a, a like an abusive load that might be, you know, a really acute tear where you've done something like very rapid, high, high force, and then you have like a intense moment where any like type of contraction is very painful, doesn't change with, you know, it doesn't warm up and get better, it's like very sore, that will typically suggest that, um, and then it improves over the course of, you know, a few weeks and then like at six weeks or, you know, 12 weeks, if you're gonna let it rest and recover, it gets much better, then you're gonna think, okay, that's 
that's going to be like that follows the path of what a muscle tear would do. But with tendinopathies and people would have, I'm sure who've had this will have experienced it is like, and, and as you did, like you rest it and it just doesn't get any better. You try and <laughs> as soon as you go to use the, you know, grip or like hanging on a bar or just like getting into a squat position, you just suddenly get this like sharp pain or you knock it against something and it's just horribly painful. But then you'll notice it often does then like warm up and feel much better once you've started actually loading it. So that's a really common theme with the tendon. And that kind of comes down to the fact that it's, it's not this big tear that's happened in the tendon. It's when you have the, uh, this abusive load that causes the tendinopathy, your tendon, like your body, I love this quote that I heard when kind of like going back over the most current research with this, one of the leading tendinopathy research in the, in the world, Australian lady named Dr. Ebony Rio, she's talking about how like the, the body being the human body being described as just a clump of cells that remodels to what it does. And I think that's just such a beautiful way of thinking about our ourselves and just a big clump of cells. Oh, and yeah, of cells that remodel yeah. to based yeah. on what we do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so I'm with like... this, you know, clump of cells, like in, in our elbows, we have the, with the tendon, basically it's always trying to like adapt to what you spend your time doing. So if you, if you suddenly done this abusive load, that's like a really, you know, whether it's a fast contraction, whether it's like long hold intense grip in, in calisthenics, then your body's like, sweet, we need to deal with this and we need to make this tendon stronger so that we can deal with that that force better next time. And so it just starts like throwing like new <laughs> um, cells in there to try and basically build up that resilience of that area to deal with the load the next time. And so when, when thinking about how we adapt to anything, like we've got our zone of adaptation, which is basically like anything above a certain level of like loading will, if we can recover from it, means we get stronger. But if we go above the like the next level, then that's going to lead to injury. And basically like if we don't give ourselves a chance to recover and we keep going above that, like that zone of adaptation, then yeah, your body's like trying to throw things in there. It's almost like thinking about a scab forming, like it's, it's getting all these cells that aren't great at their job, but they do the primary job of just like, you know, like the scab's just trying to form a protective barrier. And this is kind of what the tendinopathy is doing. It's just like laying down all these cells. It's trying to like bolster the area and it hasn't had a chance to actually remodel properly. So when it comes to the, the management of it and the treatment, and we'll talk about that, I think in the next episode, but it's, and this is why it is so painful long-term is like, if you don't actually give it the guidance of like the type of loading that you're trying to adapt to, to do, then it doesn't get the signal to use those cells that have been laid down there in a productive way. So instead of with basically with collagen fibers, which are the ones that are really good at taking that tensile load when they kind of lay down like a kind of patchwork instead of a like long string of spaghetti, for example, like if you've kind of got that, um, uh, Mitch, like the messy sort of laying down of these fibers, they then can't do their job quite as effectively. And at the beginning, that is like the inflammatory process is what brings all those cells in. But then when it's not laying down, ideally, that's where you start to get that like degenerative condition of, you know, it's not aligned very well and it's not supported by that like stimulus of loading. And that's where it starts to get that breakdown happening as well. So, so you could say that it's, no longer elastic enough to take that load and it just kind of it, it creates this like cascading effect where it gets, just gets worse and worse and worse if you keep loading it wrong yeah and so then you know if you do nothing then you become deconditioned and not only does that area become deconditioned but then all the structures around it and this is such a common issue with tendinopathy because it can be so tempting to get so zoomed in to the elbow and exactly the point of pain with a tendinopathy but you got to remember that, like it's part of a broader system and the system is so key here. So when thinking about with my way of injuring it with doing my pull-ups and wrist curls, like I was thinking, okay, what can I do to really overload that area of the, the body? And when I was doing my pull-ups, I, I quite intentionally did them with like wrong poor, poor <laughs> technique, basically like not caring about trying to bring my shoulders into it. Cause when you think about compound movements, like a pull-up, it's a combination of, you know, scapular depression and retraction, elbow, uh, sorry, shoulder extension adduction and then your elbow flexion as well. And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to try and overload the elbows by making my shoulders not work as hard. So those classic like hunchback ones, like even if I got fatigued, I got fatigued and I'd, I'd go into that kind of crappy form because I knew that's going to mean that like when thinking about the whole shoulder system, that that musculature is going to be working harder. So when we think about like rehabbing, and we're going to talk about this in a future episode is like, we want to not only think about like locally what's happening with the actual like structure in its very like <laughs> zoomed in form, but like also how can we get back to doing the movements we want to do, but by functionally deloading, by using the, like strengthening the whole system as well. So yeah. And that's, that's really literally what we're going to talk about in the next episode. So let's, let's. But just quickly on the, like, I think it's just important when thinking about like the diagnosis and management, I just remember like, you know, when you're talking about your advice was to rest, I think like it was also funny when I kind of started working it 
your gym as well, there was another healthcare practitioner who was pretty involved in the gym who was helping people with their tendinopathy or trying to, and was, you know, whenever, when you'd walk through the gym, you'd see everyone doing these ones, which if you're not watching in the video, you won't see, but it's basically <laughs> flopping my wrists back and forth. Uh, uh, yeah, just like a floppy fish. Um, <laughs> and that was this person trying to give advice, which was like, basically like giving the advice to do kind of almost like an active mobility thing, I guess, like a dynamic stretch in the same way that you do like a swimming, swinging hamstring stretch for your hamstrings. Like, I guess the thinking was, okay, we want to dynamically stretch the forearms. Um, but the problem is like, and why stretching is often aggravating is it's the, when you think about compression, it's often that compression that forces a tendon to then push against a bone that comes with going through end range of motion that then is the aggravating factor. And so when thinking about trying to like <laughs> help it, if you're doing massage and you're really rubbing it super hard on the site of attachment, or you're doing these things like a really intense forearm stretch, it's not going to be necessarily helpful because you're not increasing its capacity. You're not giving it the stimulus it needs to remodel in an effective way. And you're aggravating it by just giving it that compressive force, which it's not happy with in the first place. So, and we'll get into it. Like, and you, if you do watch the video, some like hands-on, he has like a bit of mass art, like a bit of manual therapy there. He's got one of the Theragun style things on there. And there is a place for that. But when thinking about like the first line of management, like if you just get in there and go see a massage therapist who just like sticks a thumb in and just goes to town and does nothing else, then it's probably not going to be very effective because you're basically just doing <laughs> that compressive force without any like stimulus for remodeling. Yeah. And that's very important when you look at the, when, when you, if you, if you use the other resources and I will again, remind you, we have this great resource. The golfer's elbow rehab blueprint is an extensive document end to end. It's going to help. And one of the things that he does talk about in the beginning is, you know, here he de you, you deload the, the wrist a little bit, but keep doing the movements and that massage or self you know, myofascial release or whatever you want to call it actually comes right at the end of the rehab. It's like step four after rebuilding some strength and also rebuilding that elasticity. You know, it, it, it's certainly not recommended to do that earlier. Now, let's wrap it up. I, I want to remind you guys, if you haven't already, get yourself access. It's free, the Golfers Elbow Blueprint. I'll put a link in the description of the video. And at the end of these episodes, I always really like to send you some love because, you know, there is so much content available online and it really blesses Phil and I and, and we're privileged to have you guys give us your time. If you've made it right to the end, then thank you and kudos to you because you've chosen to do this, which is effectively improving your health as opposed to just sitting there scrolling aimlessly through the plethora of useless content available online nowadays that we like to waste our time on me included so good on you and we'll see you in the next episode yeah, and this you. comes from questions so yeah like let us know your questions let us know the stupid things you've done to like better your professional <laughs> self like <laughs> injuring yourself in the, in the name of learning <laughs> or whatever that happens to be in your industry yeah we love the love the feedback so yeah, absolutely. And re and remember, you can find Phil at philwhite.me and you can also go deeper with us. If you want to, you can go to unitygym.com. We have all sorts of cool stuff available there. So thank you guys very much for joining us and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks, Phil. Bye. Uh, where is it? <clears throat> Rock on.